Night to Success with me, Ashley Owens, your personal networking concierge. Uh, 1230 and 1 o'clock on Thursdays on RVN TV, where we talk to the power networkers of the greater Philadelphia, South Jersey area, and now all over the world because we have <laughs> Zoom, and it's great. And I'm so thrilled to have Greg Sherbon here from uh, one of my networking groups. Now, two of my networking groups because yes. we're a part of a thousand of them because that's the world we live in now. Um, but you are our um, CFO on demand is the name of your company. Yes. Awesome, dude. So thank you so much for being here. We're actually having our one-on-one -on -one today. Yes. Because we actually we haven't had to do it yet. So <clears throat> so tell me what's going on. So how so with with all the stuff going on with the pandemic and everything working from home, tell first of all tell people who you are, what you do, and what makes you awesome, and then kind of how your company's been pivoting since the pandemic. Okay. Uh, CFO on demand is a uh, division of a CPA firm, Fitzpatrick, Bondavani, and Kelly. Uh, we do outsource CFO work for small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, really, just for any business owner that's trying to grow, trying to build their business, but doesn't want to bring on a full-time controller or CFO. A lot of times, yes. what we find is it's a, a small business that uh, probably has that one person who's the uh, the finance person, the HR person, the IT person. They're doing a little bit of everything, uh, and they're probably a little overwhelmed. Uh, and we can come in and not take over for them, but really kind of layer on top of what they're doing uh, and then help uh, build the business through analytics uh, as well as just the accounting. So when you are working with somebody in that space, right, so you've got, I, I've definitely heard of outsourced CFOs, outsourced CEOs, outsourced CTOs. I think it's a brilliant way of being able to kind of really maximize the efficiency without taking on a full-time, you know, person in that space. So when, you, especially around how many people can you, t and I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with this question because I think it's so interesting. How many how many clients can you take on at once without, because when you're a CFO, you're usually like zoned in yeah. onto one, one client. So how do you guys maximize your efficiency with multiple clients? Yeah, and that's something that, uh, quite honestly, we ask ourselves a lot as yeah. well to make sure that we, <laughs> we're maximizing what we do and uh, providing the, the proper amount of value to each of our clients. Uh, we can probably each, right now we have three people uh, that work for within CFO on demand and we can probably each take on 10 to 12 uh, oh, wow. clients uh, trying to make sure that we're we're giving each client uh, the maximum amount of uh, you know value that they need because every client needs something different mm -hmm. uh, some need much more of the accounting side uh, some are much more into the analytics uh, which we can go into later but um, and then some we just need to talk strategy with all the time and and try and uh, kind of handhold them and help them through the, the data day stuff <clears throat> so it really just depends on each client uh, but we feel like if we get to 10 to 12 you know full-time clients we have the occasional client that's on a uh, uh, bi-monthly or quarterly basis uh, which we kind of try not to do because it, we're not providing enough value there for them uh, you know we're not as actively involved with uh, with a client in that time because then uh, I don't know your business well enough to really uh, help you and provide the, the value that I want to um, but we want to meet with them every single month and then once we reach 10 to 12 we're probably going to be uh, each full, filled up with the amount of time that we can actually provide what can clients expect from when working with you so like say someone gives you a call so this when someone gives you a call what problem are they typically having that's also uh, completely varied okay. amongst our clientele because um, I have certain clients or we have certain clients that will come in uh, and really just need help on the accounting side um, you know it they're not getting uh, statements on a monthly basis. They're not closing the books every single month. Uh you know, or they're they're just not uh, accounting for everything correctly. You know, maybe they they're reconciling their bank accounts, but uh, that's about it, and their inventories are a mess, or uh, they really have no idea what's going on with their debt. Um, you know, that's where we can kind of come in and uh, you know for them and play that controller role and really try and make sure that the accounting is being taken care of correctly. And if we're you know for those for the first couple of months, we might be spending a lot of time with them and really sitting down and going through their accounting on a regular basis. Uh, others really come in and what they're excited about is the analytics because we can truly go in and and give uh, you know a client uh, full details of everything that's going on with their products and services and be able to tell them what's selling and what's not selling what's trending up what's trending down uh, in a way to allow them to make better business decisions and really uh, build their business uh, growing forward do you think people come to you proactively or reactively uh, too many probably reactively, and I would love it if many more came to us proactively. This um, is a BSA. Please yes. come out. Please, please take a look at this before you actually need it. Um, you know what? 
what we find is, uh, you know, somebody's recommending a, a company to us because something's wrong more than anything. Uh, what we would love to do, uh, and the way this works out best, is if they realize ahead of time, look, we're growing and we're going to need this, uh, and let's get started on it now before, uh, you know, we start having problems. What is the what is the biggest, or at least the most common denominator when it comes to someone working with you? So, like, I know we talked about your small to medium sized businesses that were perfect, yeah. but what has been something that people use or people do before that, that they need you for? So, like, if you were to, if someone were to call you up and say, you know, if you looked at, if you took an audit of all your clients, what's mm -hmm. the most common theme that people come to you for? I know you said accounting, but. It, I guess my question is, as I'm trying to figure out the question, um, what is the what has been the most common challenge that people have had um, that they could avoid? Yeah, really, that's how the question. Is. I think the best way to answer that is what people need and what we can help them get through is um, financing. So. A, a company, if we're talking about businesses that want to grow their business or owners that want to grow their business, we're talking about um, probably at some point they're going to need financing and generally bank financing. You're talking about small business loans? Yeah. Okay, so okay. if we're talking about some kind of loan that they're going to need, uh, before they get to that point, before it comes to a point where they're trying to talk to a banker and really uh, get that financing in place, they need to have uh, their accounting and their statements in a good place so that the banker can you know, take a look at it, feel comfortable with what they're seeing, uh, and then make that decision quickly for them. So I think more than anything, that's what I would love business owners to realize is at some point you're going to need a loan. You're going to need some financing, whether it's uh, capital financing for a project, uh, you want to just expand, you, maybe you're just, uh, your business is growing so fast that you're going to need uh, capital you know, daily working capital in order to get through, uh, you know, that expansion. Because a lot of times, uh, you you may be selling so fast that you're not collecting uh, nearly as fast as things are going out. So you're going to need uh, financing in that way. Whatever the reason is, at some point you're going to need financing because of that. Uh, people are going to start looking at your books, mm. and when you get to that point, you want your books to be in a really good shape, uh, so that you know that that process goes smoothly and quickly. So when. Do you have someone coming to you and saying, here, I need you to take a look at so What is the difference between you guys and an accountant? Like, what, I mean, I'm sure that you get that question often because yeah. a lot of what you do is the accounting work. So at what point is it necessary to hire a CFO? Um, so there's, there's two different ways to look at that. If we're talking about just a, a daily accountant, somebody who's there, who's doing the, the work, um, I'm not coming in uh, to, do, to be the bookkeeper. Mm. I'm not coming in. Generally, we can provide that service, but that's generally not what we're trying to do. We're trying to layer on top of the bookkeeper. We want the bookkeeper to be there every single day, um, you know, doing daily revenue audits, making sure that uh, deposits are getting taken care of, uh, the bills are getting paid. Um, you know, whatever interface they need from their point of sale or other ERP is happening so that the, the, the daily work is happening. What we're there to do is make sure then that everything's going to the right place, uh, that they're accounting for some of the higher level things, not just that they're, they're reconciling the bank account, but also that they are making sure that, um, you know, a, a lot of times a small business won't take a look and make sure that uh, what their system says uh, is really their receivables matches what's on their balance sheet. What's really their inventory matches what's on their balance sheet because things can get booked to the wrong place. Um, and you need to be able to handle that and really understand that. And then also taking a look at the, the P&L and be able to say, okay, what are my real expenses? You know, is everything going to the right places? Am I booking things on a regular basis uh, so that you have comparable periods uh, to whether whether it's last month, last year? Um, not enough uh, companies have a budget, making sure that they're they're planning for the future. Uh, we're here to m help them do all of that and not just the daily work. What do you love about what you do? For me, it's the uh, the analytics more than anything. Why? Uh, I, I spent a lot of time. So going into my background, uh, I worked 18 years in the casino industry. I'm sorry. We should have let it be that. <laughs> so, um, Stop. Did you, okay, wait, did you count, not count cards, did you, could you probably No, no, cards? absolutely not. Uh, working in the casino industry kept me from really spending any time <laughs> actually gambling. Uh, I, I, spend, I spent very little time uh, and almost none in Atlantic City since uh, I worked there. But Vegas. Uh, okay. A couple times <laughs> in Vegas, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I spent 18 years in the casino industry. Um, 
after I moved to the East Coast. Wow. So, uh, so doing what in the casino industry? So I was an accountant. I, I started at wow. uh, Mohegan Sun Casino in Connecticut two months before it opened wow. uh, back in 1996. Uh, and I was there for about a year. And then the, the company that owned uh, was part owner in Mohegan Sun, Sun International, bought resorts in Atlantic City, and I moved down to, and I worked there for about eight and a half years, and then another eight and a half years for uh, the Atlantic City Hilton. So, so and accounted for the, the casino, or for like the people that probably need accounts no, no, out of it's the movies? The, I'm thinking it's all just things for, right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as crazy as it sounds uh, in, in it be. movies, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's, very, uh, it's a very corporate structure, so I started as a staff accountant, uh, worked my way up to, you know, accounting manager, then director of finance, and eventually the vice president of finance. Wow. Wow. And so why did you leave the casino industry? Unfortunately, the casino that I was working for at the time, the Atlantic City Hilton, which at the end of its life was the Atlantic Club, closed in 2014. Got it. Uh, so when, when that happened, I decided it was a good time to get out of the casino industry and try something new. So the analytics do what for you? Like, what is, what is the most satisfying part about the metrics and the analytics when you're working with a company? The great thing is it gives you insights that you, you don't normally see just by looking at a P&L. So, um, um, the, the clients that I have, whether if we're talking like a restaurant client, I'm breaking down their entire menu. I'm looking at every single thing that they sell on the menu and telling them the trends of whether it's selling more, it's selling less. Um, you know, one of the things that we're, we're working on with our, our clients right now is then also, uh, you know, spot checking costs and how much it costs for different menu items and being able to say, okay, are these things profitable or are they not profitable? Uh, I have a liquor store client that we're breaking down every single thing that they sell uh, and telling them what's profitable and not profitable. I can tell them the gross profit margin on every single thing wow. and they have 26,000 items in their <laughs> system. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a lot to go through, but once you have it set up, it's great. And the great thing is to be able to tell a, a client as we sit down and we go through meetings and we drill into this analysis, uh, you know, Here's certain things that you can take out. Here's certain things that you can uh, you can move off the menu, or you can just get off the shelves um, because it's not selling. Mm -hmm. So if you're if you're asking or if you're looking at a time like now, liquor stores obviously during this time are doing very very well. Um, if it's not selling right now, it's probably not ever going to sell. Well, pumpkin should be a thing that's out the <laughs> roof right now. Yeah, everything everything is doing great. <laughs> but if you're going through vodkas or you're going through wines, if you're going through, you know a a twelve dollar, twelve to thirteen dollar wine list. Um, you know that's kind of a, a general. Um, you know, if you look at twelve dollar reds, that's your probably your biggest selling wines in a in a liquor store. Mm -hmm. But if you have fifty of those and only thirty five of them are actually selling, you know, maybe the last fifteen you need to to get rid of. You know, replace that with something else that might sell better, or just replace it with, uh, you know, the things that are selling like crazy because you need more shelf space. Um, and also being able to say, okay, <clears throat> if I'm looking at the gross profit margin of, say, vodka, and vodka is selling like crazy, but you see that your margins are going down every single month. Um, you know, during this time, uh, you know, prices on things have been changing like crazy. Whether you're, if you're in a restaurant, uh, meats for the first couple of months were went through the roof. Uh, so you need to adjust your prices on things. If it's, uh, you know, and certain other certain liquors were, went through the roof as well. Well, if you don't adjust your prices on that, then maybe you're selling it like crazy, but you're also not making it. You might be making less money on it than you were a year ago, and you need to be able to see that. And I love how your entire <coughs> body just opened up when I asked you what you <laughs> loved about, and you went into metrics. And I, I think you enjoy the bones. You, you see the bones of how things are made, and I love that. Yes. But when we return, we're going to talk more about those bones and more about um, Greg and how he networks and his tactical tips and practical takeaways being a CFO on demand. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Dr. Jacqueline Kerbeck. I'm a TV show host right here on RVN TV, and I'm a radio personality on Business Talk Radio out of New York. I've interviewed many interesting people who have stories of inspiration and hope. As a certified life coach, I help my clients eliminate ineffective patterns of behavior so that they can formulate an action plan to help them meet their goals both personally and professionally. As an investment fund manager providing alternative investments to the stock market and as a licensed insurance producer, I help my clients accumulate wealth. Work with me so I can help you personally, professionally, and financially. 
you can reach me by going to my website, drjacqueline.com, where you can email me, Jacqueline at drjacqueline.com. Let's work together to help you be all you can be. to the show that is the show. My name is Ashley Owens. Uh, we're just talking about Greg's weird background about living in Montana that he did not tell me the first half of the show. So now you're going to tell the story. So you lived in Montana and I, they're I, killers over there. I was born in Iowa. Oh. When I was five, my parents moved to Montana. Okay. And I lived there until I graduated high or college. Okay. So I lived in Billings, Montana. Um, you know, it's it's very different than South Jersey. <laughs> There's well, hills the and uh, yeah. So the big difference is really winter. Yeah. Um, uh, most people won't remember this, but in uh, 1996 or 95, I think it was early 1996, there was a horrendous uh, snowstorm, winter storm in the East Coast that shut down everything. Yeah. We had the exact same winter storm in Montana, only we didn't shut down anything. <laughs> uh, it was 70 below zero. It was in my final year of college, and I was still going to class <laughs> every single day. What the hell? Yeah, so you literally, you out there, my How? car had a had a um, an engine block heater, so you would plug in your car at night to keep it warm. Um, and then the next morning, uh, I lived with five guys. And I would so just jump anxiety. everybody else's car in order to, <laughs> so we could all go to school. And then uh, you get to school, and you just go from building to building across campus trying to get there without dying because oh. it was so cold. Um, that's like that's actual death, though. Yeah, it's it was not really, like really, really cold. It's pretend death. Like, yeah. oh, it's 60 degrees out. I'm going to yeah. die out here. Yeah, I only missed, uh, the only time I ever got out of going to class was one time in high school for like a day when it was like 80 below zero and uh pretty much the whole high school still went to like the the mall on the other side of town because <laughs> nobody wanted to stay at home because so, you're a warrior we're just so, used to it so is the is the winters here like Oof. yeah usually except for you know the one uh like 10 12 years ago where uh you know, we got like six feet of snow, and I had uh, a snowplow stuck in my in my road that would kept me from getting out and going to work for like three days. But, oh my gosh! Yeah, that was great. Jeez. All right. Well, let's talk about your resiliency because <laughs> that's a thing that we need to talk about. Um, <clears throat> 80 below zero is out of control. Like, that's death. It's like, not fun. Like, you walk out, and I feel like everything's frozen. Everything hurts immediately. Oh. Yeah. That this story is giving me anxiety. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's talk. <laughs> It's a networking show. Let's talk about networking. <laughs> so, Greg, tell me, so when you are working, since each of you guys can take on to 10 to 12 clients, right, mm -hmm. um, what has been your, the best way for you to network? I would think because you are a, a boutique shop that it was, it's primarily referral. Yes. And with referral, it comes with building the no let, the like, and the trust factor in networking. So you and I are part of two different networking groups. But when you got out of the corporate casino world into this kind of like working for yourself, mm -hmm. let's talk about the transition and some of the things that you did to build up your network. Yeah, so that was very hard for me because yeah. for 
all of the time before I did this job, I never had to network. And uh, I was okay with it at the time. Um, I took that as a challenge when I took this job and I, I really enjoy the networking part now. Uh, but it was scary to start off with because um, I remember within about a week of taking this job, I went to uh, an Atlantic City Chamber of Commerce uh, outing. And it, it was near my house, so I was like, all right, I'm just gonna go and see, see what happens. And um, luckily there were two people there that I knew. Um, one was, a, was an old colleague, and she left within like five minutes of me getting there. And I was like, ah, that's, that sucks. And then, uh, and then the other was a, was a banking acquaintance that I hadn't seen in like 12 years. And it was one of those, I, looking across the room, like, I think I know her. Yeah. But other than that, I knew no one there. And it was truly awful because I'm not, I, I'm not comfortable in that situation of just walking up to random people that I don't know and trying to start a conversation. So uh, that was hard. And, but my goal at the time was, look, I'm going to meet one or two people at every single one of these events I go to and hope that as I keep going on, eventually I will know 10 to 15 people when I walk in the door. Um, now, as I was, I was building that up, suddenly this, uh, you know, pandemic happened and everything started happening through through Zoom, uh, which is 10 times easier uh, to get through. And <laughs> I was like, this is the best. <laughs> so I don't have to do any of that stuff anymore. Because now we know people and if you, we have any of these in-person events again, I can feel comfortable that I'll, yeah. I'll go and there'll be, you know, 10 or 15 people there that I probably this know. This pandemic is great. <laughs> <laughs> the only good thing to come from this is that you I... You have to leave your house? <laughs> yeah, oh, exactly. I, gosh, okay, so, so this is actually a really good, interesting topic because usually I talk to people about their transition from on-site to online, but you went from ish on site to loving the online. Yes. So how have you been able to, to, to network with people online? Uh, luckily, I was connected to a couple of people that just kind of helped me get started yeah. and uh, helped me get connected to people like you and a few other, you know, power networkers that that made it so much easier. Because once you got, once I got into a couple of these groups, the ones that we're, we're involved with together, uh, it becomes so much easier to, to do this and to, when you're giving your pitch, you know, five, six times a week, um, it's much easier to, to do that and feel comfortable with it and to start recognizing who it is you want to talk to and who can help you. Um, uh, you know, some of the, the things that, that really stuck out to me r right at the beginning, um, I think, was being on one of Ryan Harbison's big... Uh, don't give you know, Ryan any credit uh, no. for anything. He's got like 50 or 60 people it's on one of these so calls. so annoying. Yeah. I love him. He's one of the best networkers in the South Jersey area, and I love trolling him. So don't talk. We can't say Ryan here. No, I'm just but kidding. Yes, on one of those, guy. I think it was uh, Keisha Butler. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Said on there to, uh, to get rid of uh, people on your LinkedIn list, mm -hmm. which I had always been kind of uh, uncomfortable with LinkedIn because I was connected to so many people and I didn't know who half of them were and it didn't make any sense to, for me to even be connected with them. And literally after that call, I spent the rest of the day uh, just losing connections to people on there that I either didn't know or I didn't feel like they were any help to me to have on there. And I got rid of, I think, 350 connections that I had. Uh, I was down to 160 or something like that. Um, and I know everybody's goal is to get to that 500 plus or whatever is listed on there. But I thought, you know what? Now I look at it as most people who probably have that can't tell you who at least half the people are on there. And I've, I've built it. I got it down to 160. I think I'm back up to like 250 through this time. Of, but I, now I can go through and tell you who every single person is that I'm connected to. And that is honestly, that, that kind of networking activity varies between the kinds of people that, that mm -hmm. personality-wise. Like for you, who's more on the introverted side, like you definitely appreciate the one-on-ones. Yes. You don't need a ton of people to be able to know who you are. You just need the right people to know who you are right and as you're building up these relationships it's kind of like especially when I train my clients I always tell them I'm like your your network is an example of your army who do you want in your army who do you want as your lieutenant who do you want as your sergeant who do you want as your second in command right. and then who do you need as your soldiers and as you build up those soldiers may come in and out but it really depends on what your object, what, what the object of your networking activity is. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a great idea. I mean, people, yeah, like to your point, they talk about the 500 plus, but or they drop their number of LinkedIn connections and conversation, like they're trying <laughs> to figure out the Fibonacci sequence. Yeah, it's obnoxious. It's like, okay, but have you nurtured that network? Right. Are you educating your audience? Because there's people on my, I think I have about like 4,000, but there's people on mine that I have the chance of talking to that mm -hmm. I connect with. Otherwise. 
or I reach out to for a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So I've at least spoken to them. Right. And then I push out information that is helpful and educational rather than being like, I know, you know, I know the majority of those people, but it just depends on the, the, what you're trying to do with your network. So what has been your, did you, I'm sorry, do you have something to say? No, go, go yeah. ahead. What has been your um, favorite part about the virtual networking piece? I think those one-on-ones, like you were saying, um, I've had a couple of them. I think the best one-on-ones that I've had have had very little discussion of business and yeah. what we do. I had one yesterday that lasted an hour, and I usually schedule them for half an hour. But it, I realized 45 minutes in that we hadn't talked about our, e either of our businesses at all. Uh, and it was awesome. And those, yeah. those I love. And I had uh, another one a couple months ago with a banker who, was, who I really, you know, we connect with very well. Uh, she and I didn't talk about business until like the very end. I was like, hey, by the way, I should probably tell you what it is I do. But, you know, we were talking about dogs and we were talking about kids and we were talking about other things. And the one yesterday, we were talking about yoga for, I think, uh, 35 minutes. And that is such a better way of getting to know somebody because, again, you don't really care about what they do. It's more right. about how they made, the, made you feel, but you're building. They'll trust you once you decide to work with people on a one on one basis professionally, but. People network with people that they like. They refer yes. people that they like. That's exactly it. I'm, I've got favorites. Yeah. That's why I have a VIP list. i got favorites. <laughs> I'm not saying that they've given me stuff, but they're cool people, and I right. know they're going to take good care of the referrals that I give them. Yes, I'm, I'm much more likely to go out of my way to try and find a referral for somebody that I've connected to personally as opposed to, oh, we had a you know, a 10-minute conversation, and, you know, we, I now know what they do. They know what I do. Great. That's kind of why I don't think I really got into BNI, even though it's very, very helpful for a lot of groups. Yes. I just, I thought the forced referral, when I haven't built that connection with somebody, um, it, it's like, I don't really like you. I don't really like you, dude. Like, I'm yeah. not going to give you my A team here. I might give right. you my C team, but even then, it's, it's a little rough. Um, so, so we're going to wrap up in a second. But okay. The last question that I have for you is, um, who is your ideal client? My ideal client uh, is any business owner that wants to build their business. Um, really, that you know they've they've got a couple million dollars in revenue, but they mm -hmm. just they want to do more. And it's uh, I'm really looking for clients that are open um, and aggressive in trying to build their business and want to see that analytics because a lot of times what we see. Um, you know, if it's somebody who wants to grow their business, but they've been in the business for a very long time. They've got blinders on. Yeah, they've, yeah. they go everything by their gut, they, their experience, and that, that means much more to them than, uh, you know, somebody who's a little more open to the analytics part, because like I said, that's what I love, and I, I think it's so helpful to somebody who, if they're open and really want to see it, then I'm excited to work with them. Perfect. To me, favor look into that camera and tell people how they can find you. Uh, I'm can be found at uh, CFO <laughs> CFO Demand dot com, or uh, I can be emailed at uh, Greg S at CFO Demand dot com. Awesome, Greg. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. This is awesome. I'm so glad we get to have one on one. Now I know I've got a few people I can introduce you to. Thank you everybody for watching Connect to Success with me, Ashley Owens, 12 31 o'clock on Thursdays during your lunch break, where we talk to the power networkers of the greater Philadelphia and South Jersey area. I need a tan. I can't, I can't, I keep looking here and looking there. It's a, it's a problem. Well, anyway, it's only September. I'm sure you can get one by now. <laughs> I gotta go get the fake tan. I am from Jersey. Anyway, if you'd like to be a guest on the show and hang out with me, please email Ashley at ashleyassists.com and we'll have you in the show. We'll talk about your tactical tips and practical takeaways and networking. See you next week, guys. Thank you so much.